it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Morten Schultzberg. And for those of you who were not here on Wednesday, I just want to briefly say that he is a first year PhD student, actually starting the second year, PhD student in statistics at Uppsala University, Sweden. Happens to be the same university that I got my PhD degree at in that topic of statistics. And he happens to be my nephew, so it's kind of a fun, <laughs> unique situation. And the aim here now is to give you a variety in terms of speakers, but also try to broaden the application scope. So uh, that's his task today. He'll start off with some technical observations, and he'll end with uh, a little teaser on analyzing data that's totally different than the typical psychology data that we have talked about so far. Ladies and gentlemen, Morten Schultzberg. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about several different things. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the sample size uh, requirements, but I will try to build a case here. So I will give you my take on uh, uh, why I enjoy or why I like these models so much and what you can do with them. But we will, we will build up towards the simulation study that I did together with Bengt on the sample size requirements when it comes to number of time points per individuals and number of individuals that are required to get good quality of the estimation of these models. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, R package, M plus automation, that I tend to use a lot when I do large simulation studies. And I think it's a very nice tool if you use M plus a lot, and especially if you do simulation studies. And I'm going to give you a minimum working example of that uh, so that more of you can, can utilize this function. And then I'm going to talk about non-normal distributed random coefficients and talk about the uh, assumptions, that the model assumptions about the, the latent random coefficients and see what happens if we have non-normal distributions of these coefficients in the population. And finally, like Bengt said, I'm going to talk about some other kind of data. I'm going to talk about household electricity consumption data and see uh, actually see if if an intervention can change people's behavior when it comes to the electricity consumption, using the DSEM models actually, actually as a tool to design the study. All right, so start with the motivation. So this is an example that I'm going to use throughout uh, the simulation study just to, to make it easier to interpret the results, to have something to kind of connect it to. So imagine a group of individuals that has quit smoking. I think the example has already been but this is kind of a toy example, just so you understand what I talk about, which effects I'm talking about. Uh, so everyone has tried to quit smoking, and when they have quit smoking, we measure the smoke urge several times a day for, say, 30 days. And also, we, waited, we measured the weight before quitting and the weight at the end of the study. So you can see the change in weight during the period where they quit smoking. So we might ask questions then about this data, such as, can different weight gains be explained by differences in the urge process? So is it the case that certain types of uh, urge process are associated with weight gains or weight losses or very stable weight during this quitting smoking? And in that case, what kind of urge process is associated with large weight gains? And what kind? How can we quantify different urge processes? So that's kind of how I think about this two-level model. And finally, can the differences in urge process between individuals be explained by other covariates, such as age, gender, or health? So if I know something about your gender, your age, and your health, can I say something about how your smoke urging process likely looks, or how, how, you, how you're going to behave? So let's look at three individuals. Seems like some of the lines have fallen out here. but. Anyway, we have uh, time on the uh, x-axis here and smoke urge on the y-axis, and we have three individuals. So how can we quantify the difference between these individuals? What, what differences are there in their smoke urge processes? The, mean, the most obvious one might be the mean level, right? We can see that these three individuals have pretty different means. So if we wanted to separate them, we could use the random mean in the model. So when I say random, I mean individual specific, really. So we can allow for that. So that would be one way to quantify their differences. So what more might we use? Uh, and this is where I think it becomes interesting, because the mean is something that we tend to use a lot of the times. But what more can we 
actually, what more can we learn from this longitudinal dimension of the data? And if we look at the smoothness of these plots, we see that the upper one and the lower one is jumping up and down, whereas this red one in the middle is smooth, implying that this individual have a higher autocorrelation over time, which means that if this individual has a high smoke urge at one point in time, it's likely to have a high smoke urge also at the next point in time. So it's kind of a more predictable behavior. So we might add that. We might add a random autocorrelation, autoregressive coefficient. So each individual can have their own. And finally, if we look at the upper and the lower one, they might have the same autoregressive coefficient. They're jumping up and down. But we can see that the variance is larger in the upper one than the lower one. So finally, we can add then the random residual variance. And these are the three key parameters that I know you heard a lot about. So this is how I think about it. It's just a good way to quantify the differences between people's processes over time, really. And now we might go back to the questions and, and ask questions like, can the values of the random coefficients be predicted by some covariates, such as age, gender, and health? Because now we kind of agree that, or at least I agreed with myself, that this is a good way to quantify, <laughs> to quantify the difference in urge process. So now, can we predict an individual's values on these three uh, coefficients by covariates such as age, gender, and health? Can we explain? Is it the case that people that are old tend to have a higher mean smoke urge process or a higher autoregressive coefficient or whatever? And can the random coefficients be used as predictors for weight change? So if I know the value on these three covariates, oh, sorry, on these three coefficients, your, your mean, your autoregressive coefficient, and your residual variance, can I say something about whether or not you're likely to gain or lose weight if you quit smoking? So, as you all know by now, with the DSEM modeling framework, these three random coefficients can be utilized both as independent and dependent variables. So both as predictors and also so we can try to predict them. We can do it separately in two different models or in one model, so a full mediation model, using the coefficients as mediators. So that kind of leads us into the DSEM models. And I know we have seen this a lot now, so I'm just showing you, I guess, a fourth way of drawing these. But I guess it's most similar to Banks. But I got to say that Ellen kind of convinced me yesterday that her way might be, uh, I don't know, a better way. I didn't say, I didn't say you have to do it. Yeah. No, she didn't force me. He just listened to my talk. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but it, this makes good sense for very complex models because we can't, it's hard to display everything. But I think this says something. But I, I think you should always have the decomposition in mind. So now you have to imagine, we have this latent decomposition going on here. It's not very clear from this picture, but it's happening for sure in, in M+. So what we have here is we have urge at time t regressed on urge at the previous time point, right? And we allow for a random uh, intercept, a random autoregressive coefficient, and a random residual variance indicated by this filled black circle. So this is on the within level, within individuals across time. And on the between level, then, we can model the distribution of these three coefficients. And you know now we, we always model in the log of the residual variance to keep it positive. And we could add then, for example, age. So continuous covariate, uh, and this would not be a time variant covariate now. So I'm, I'm thinking that we're looking at a couple of weeks here, so you have the same age in terms of years. Uh, so we have age. So maybe we can predict then, say something about whether or not you have a high or low mean, how or low autoregress coefficient and log residual variance according to your age. So this will be what I will refer to as model one. So I'm going to look at, I've simulated data on a model like this and see what it takes in terms of number of individuals and number of time points per individual to get a good estimation out of a model like this. So this is one of the models that we're going to look at the results for. I'm calling it model one now, just to keep track of them. And the second model then is, slightly more complex, we add the weight difference. So a continuous outcome here, uh, and we try to explain then the weight difference as on, by the random coefficients and also the age here. So this is what I refer to as a full mediation model. We could think about it as the effect of age on the weight difference that is direct and that is mediated through these three random coefficients. And this is what I will refer to as model two in the outputs later. All right. So the simulation study that I did, I looked at different allocations of N and T, different number of individuals and time points. So why would we want to do that? How does these different sizes come up? And I probably, you know a lot about it since uh, 
since a lot of you probably has this kind of data. But I'm just going to quickly motivate that if we have, for example, self-reported smoking urge, like in the example I was talking about, the only thing that the participant need is a smartphone, really. So it's pretty cheap to collect many individuals at many time points. So you would end up with a lot of, lot of individuals measured a lot of times. So maybe 200 individuals measured 100 times or something like that. But you might also have a situation where you want to measure blood sugar. And you have this device that gives you very precise estimates of the blood sugar level each minute. So you have a very high frequency. However, it's a very expensive device, so you can only have a few number of participants. Uh, and I, I'm make, making this up. I know I heard some guys talking about an example like this, so they probably know if it's an expensive device or not. But uh, let's, let's think this, this particular device is very expensive. So we end up with a large number of time points, but only for a few number of individuals. And finally, we might have a situation where we try to measure the cognitive ability. And we have to measure that by a psychologist. So a psychologist has to sit down with the participant at each time, which makes each individual and each time point very expensive because the psychologist has this high salary. <laughs> so this motivates why we want to look at different allocations here, right? We need to, we need to, is it better or worse to have some of these? So the questions that we, I tried to answer is, what sizes of N and T are needed for good estimation of the DSM models? That's the first question. And when I say good, I mean uh, nice precision in the point estimate and the standard error, and also power, of course. So power above 80% or 0 0.8. And the second, also very interesting, can a large N compensate for a small T? So if you have a lot of individuals measured a few times, is that equally good as having few individuals measured a lot of times? Is some of them better? So what we looked at was three different cases. So the first case we said, OK, say that we have 200 individuals in a study. How many times do we need to measure them to get a good estimation going on? So we have 200 individuals measured 10 times, 200 individuals measured 15 times, 20 times, and so on. So this is this case. We have n here on the x-axis and t on the y-axis. So this, the blue crosses here. That's the cases we looked at. So 200 individuals measured number, different number of times. And the second case is, say by the sign that we have 100 time points. We know we're going to measure some 100 time points for some reason. How many individuals would we need? So if we have a lot of time points, how many individuals would we need? So we did the same thing. We said 10 individuals measured 100 times, 15 individuals measured 100 times, 25 individuals measured 100 times, and so on. And then just to get a more conclusive picture of this, I also added a case where we in increase N and T simultaneously. So 10 individuals measured 10 times, 25 individuals measured 25 times, and so on. So try to capture at least a part of this space here. All right, so before I show you the results for the two models, uh, I just want to introduce a measured total number of observations, which is essentially number of individuals times number of time points per individuals. So you can think about this as number of data points in your data set, really, right? So if you have 200 individuals measured 10 times, that would mean you have 2,000 observations in your data matrix. But if you would have 20 individuals measured 100 times, you would also have the total number 2,000, right? So you would have the same amount of data in your data set, but different allocations to N and T. And finally, if you would have 45 individuals measured 45 times, you would also have close to 2,000. So the point here is that you can have the same size on your data matrix, but with very different allocations to N and T. So this is a good scale. The total number of observation is a good common scale to compare these three settings. So we're going to look at the results in plots like these. Uh, and this is just, I'm going to come back to this plot. I just want to explain the axis here so you understand what's going on. So on the x-axis here, we have the total number of observations, N times T. And on the y-axis, in this case, we have power. We will have also the mean squared error. So in this case, and then we have the three cases. So in this case, if we look at the, the red one, which is n equals 200 at the point where the total number of observation is equal to 2,000, that implies that we have 200 individuals measured 10 times, which would give 2,000. We have power close to 1. If we compare that to the case where we have 100 time points, which implies 20 individuals measured 100 times, for this case, we have power lower than half of that. So if, for this specific coefficient, doesn't matter in this case, what I, I will get back to this, but you have half the power if you have few individuals measured a lot of times as if you have a lot of individuals measured a few times. So this is what we will look at, these kinds of plots, to, to see what kind of allocation is best for that parameter. 
Okay, so back to the models now. I just want to recap. So this, this is the first model that we're going to look at, and we're going to look at the slopes of uh, the, the, the random coefficients regressed on age. So I'm calling them A, B, and C here. And we're going to evaluate, evaluate them in terms of the mean squared error, so as a measure of precision, and the power. So now it's going to be a lot of information on the next slide. So here it is. All right, so the upper row is the power, the lower row is the mean squared error, and then we have the slope A, slope B, and slope C. So if we start by looking at the mean squared error here, we see that it's very low for almost all different total number observations, except the T equals N case, where the total number of observations is equal to 100. And that's because we have 10 individuals measured only 10 times. So this is a very small data set. So we have some substantial mean squared error there. But for all the other cases, we don't have a, an issue with this for these three slopes. So we don't have to take that into account when we look at the power. Otherwise, we, we got to make sure that we have good precision in the, in the confidence intervals and so, so on before we evaluate the power. So we can look at the power without taking this into account, really. So the first upper left one is the exact same one we've already seen. So this is the random mean regressed on age. And we see exactly the same thing, of course. Uh, in this case, it's best to have a lot of individuals measured few times than having few individuals measured a lot of times. And in the middle, kind of expected, we have the n equals t case, which is kind of a middle way between them. And this pattern seems to hold for all these three plots. And for all, for, sorry, for all these three slopes. So it's better for all these three slopes Regardless of which of these three random coefficients you're trying to predict, it's better to have a lot of individuals with a few time points than the other way around. And the second pattern that we see here is that the random mean is easier to predict than the random auto regressive coefficient, and especially the random residual variance. And the solid line here is 0 0.8, so power which we would consider good usually. All right, so for the second model then, we have this a bit more complex model where we have the weight difference regressed on the random uh, coefficients and age. We're going to focus now on these three slopes. So I'm calling them again A, B, and C. So this is essentially if we can explain some of the weight difference by the values of the random coefficients. And again, we're going to look at mean squared error and power. And the first thing you should notice here is that the x-axis now extends up to 90,000 total number observations. Before, it was only 10,000. So this kind of shows that this model is a lot more heavy to get good precision out of than the previous model. So now we are extending up to 90,000 instead of 10,000. So that's the first thing. And if we look at the mean squared error now again first, we see that we have actually some substantial mean squared error, especially for when we try to use the random residual variance as a predictor. However, at the point where the power starts to reach the good region, so above 0 0.8, the mean square error is low for all three cases. So if you look at the, the, the sample sizes at which the power is good enough, we don't really have to take this into account. But if we look at the lower parts here, then we definitely have to take this bad precision into account. So looking at the upper row now, we see a very similar pattern. We see that it's for small total number observation, it's best to have large number of individuals. And actually now you see that they cross. And this is expected because they are special cases of each other. So if you think about it, they're supposed to cross. Even if it's always best to have a high number of individuals, they will cross. And actually, we've, you could see this in the previous plots as well, but I cropped them because everything was essentially perfect. So I didn't want to show you like straight lines. So we see this. And so th this holds for all three. So this pattern, again, shows that it's best to have a lot of individuals rather than having a lot of time points for a few individuals. And again, the pattern that uh, the random mean is easier to use as a predictor than the random auto regressive coefficient, and especially now the random residual variance. So the pattern again repeats for this model, even though it takes a lot more total number of observations to get to good precision. So I summarized this in the paper that we're writing in what I call guidelines plots. And, um, these are recommendations, and I want to say right away that this is simulation study, so the model assumption is correct. So a lot of things here is very nice and neat. So this is a very, like a, a first guideline, so we have a clue what we need. But of course, you have to be careful with thinking that you will always be okay by using these rules or rule of thumbs. So what we have here is uh, 
n on the x-axis and t, number of time points per individual, on the y-axis. And the small black circles are all the different allocations of n and t that I've simulated on for these models. And the gray shaded area is where the, sample, uh, where the estimation quality is good. So the precision, there's essentially no bias and the standard error is very accurate. And the power is above uh, 0 0.8 for all parameters on the between level. All the, all the, yeah. So what we can see here for model one is that you can, you can get good, good estimation with different allocations. You could have 150 individuals measured only 25 times. Or you could have 75 individuals measured 75 times. Or you could have 50 individuals measured 150 times and still get the same kind of quality in your estimation for this model. For model two, it takes a lot more. As we saw already on the, plots, the previous plots, you would need to have around 200 individuals measured more than 200 times for all the parameters on the between level, all the slopes to be significant. Uh, However, the residual variance is a large part of this large number. So if you're not interested in the residual variance, the random residual variance, this could probably be lowered a lot. So to summarize, large n can compensate, better, can compensate for a small t better than vice versa. So in general, it's better to have a lot of individuals measured a few times than the other way around. And the regressions of the random coefficients have a lower sample size demand than regressions using the random coefficients as predictors. So it's easier to predict them than using them as predictors. And the random mean has lower demands than the random motor regressive coefficient and especially the random residual variance. So for model one here, I would recommend then t larger than 25 and n larger than 200. And for model two, I would recommend t and n larger than 150. And even though that's not consistent with the plot, I would not recommend to use this complex model unless you have at least moderately strong effects on the between level. Because the, the simulation study was based on weak effects. And I think for this kind of complex model, you need to have a bit higher signal to noise ratio for this to make sense. It's just so many things going on. So, I've, I've tried to, to just increase the effect size a little bit, and the sample size demand decreased a lot. So if you're expecting to have moderately strong effects rather than weak effects, then you can probably lower these demands pretty drastically. And in the paper, we consider nine model variations. I, I hope this paper will be up on the, web, uh, on the M plus web page soon, this fall at least. And we consider nine models, and some of the models we consider different um, different effect sizes, and so we also look at some model misspecifications and, and some other interesting stuff. So that about that. So how did I do this uh, simulation study then? As people has used M plus a lot know that M plus has a very nice simulation function. It's the Monte Carlo functions. Uh, so I've used that. So it's nothing, nothing new except syntax for these decent models. Um, but what I did here was that I ran batches of simulation. In the end, I, I think I ran 400 different simulations. So to don't have to be awake day and night to start the new one when the other one was done, I used the M plus automation package to just run these in, in queues. So what I did was that I had three and sometimes four parallel, parallel M plus applications uh, running on, 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 I had two computers. So four, uh, usually three, but sometimes four on each computer. So it, my computers, they have eight threads. So I could, and, we, and since we, um, each simulation uses two threads by the processor equals two option, which is kind of the optimal way here. We, we don't really benefit from adding more because we run these two chains. I just want to elaborate a bit on that. You could add more chains, of course, but you want to be sure that each of these chains converge. So then you would have to run, say that you would increase to four chains, then you still have to run them very far to be sure that you don't have this premature stoppage problem. So this is kind of the optimal way, I figured. And the reason why I only ran three sometimes because I had to do emails and other boring stuff, so. <laughs> uh, all right, so now we're gonna talk about some caveats that I've found, and I think that it's good to think about, especially if you're doing simulation studies uh, with the Bayesian estimator, if, if you're not used to doing that. I, for sure, was not, so. Some things that I was thinking about was the be iter command. And I know that we talk about this command a bit, but what it essentially say, this is the number of iterations in the Bayesian algorithm. So number of draws from the Gibbs sampler, if you speak that lingo. Uh, and this means that we will, we will 
M plus will make 5,000 iterations at least, after which it will stop on the potential scale reduction criterion. So if it has converged after 5,000, it will stop there. If it hasn't converged, if the PSR is not very close to 1, it will continue until it converges. Uh, so this is good for convergence, of course. I don't want to have the premature stoppage problem. But these models that I ran, they, they, almost all of them converged after three or 400 iterations. So the question is, why would I need to boost this up to 5,000? I would, I would be happy with 2,000. I, I, I think that would be safe in this case. Well, so there's other things to think about when you do simulation studies with these. And that's the coverage and the power. Because the coverage, so the confidence interval, is based on the percentiles of the posterior distribution. So the very high and the very low percentiles, right? So in order to get good estimates of this, we need to have a lot of samples to get a lot of samples out in the tails, essentially. So the quality of the confidence interval estimate is essentially a function of how many draws you make here. Uh, so the problem, though, is that so in, in an empirical data set, you would, you would probably have a lot, a lot larger number here. You have, you've seen 20,000, 50,000, and Ellen said something about 500,000, but that had to do with Dick, I guess. Uh, so we would upper this in, if we had one data set. But I'm running uh, 500 or 1,000 replications, and I have 400 different ones. So I don't want to increase this to 10,000. It took me about three months to run the study. I don't want to increase it to six months. I definitely don't want to increase it to 50,000, because that would be, I guess, some years. So this is something that you have to think about. And th this also affects power, right? Because power essentially is the, the percentage of the confidence interval that did not cover zero. So if you want to have good precision in this, you will have to pay the price by upper, uppering this a lot. So what I kind of landed on was that I would accept coverage between 92% and 98%. Because I could see that if I, if I did increase it for some of the iterations, it became perfect after a while. So it, 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 it was almost always just a function of the low number of B iterations here. But this is something that you have to be aware of, because I was, they were going up and down. Even though I increased the number of individuals and time points, it didn't stabilize. And that's because I don't have enough, really, to get the good precision of the, the tails of the posterior distribution. And then what uh, Thierry mentioned, the stationarity problem. I don't know how much time series training you've done. I, for one, didn't really like uh, our basic training in time series that I took because we only talked about econom economics data, so interest rates and other stuff, and always only one individual. But I've relearned that it's bad to have an autoregressive coefficient larger than one. And uh, there's some things you have to think about here, and, I mean, uh, and uh, Tiamir mentioned this. So when you generate data, if you have one individual that has a, since we have a random coefficient, we're drawing from a normal distribution. So we have we have positive probability of, of, of drawing an a autoregressive coefficient larger than 1, obviously. So if that happens, we will have non-stationary series. So we will, have, we will generate data that explodes. We'll have super large values. And this is OK, because M plus has a detection limit. So if the generated data is larger than 10,000, I think it is, you will get a warning. So M plus will say, the data that we generated now was so large. So we will skip this replication and just move on to the next. We will not do the analysis here because something was off. Probably, and I think it says probably due to non-stationarity. So that's good. But it only helps for large t, I claim here. And the problem is that it will not start with exploding. It, if it has a non-stationary process, it will explode eventually. We don't really know when. But for a short time period, so if you only generate 10 time points, it might not have had time, so to speak, to explode. So it might be on its way to explode, but it will not be 10,000 yet. It might be 100 or 200. Uh, so, and if you increase that, then it will come closer and closer to, to 10,000. And at some point, it will explode over the limit, so M plus detects it. And this can give very weird results, because what I did was I was increasing T, and I got worse and worse results. Because I had some individuals that had non-stationary processes that were becoming larger and larger. So the data was weirder and weirder, so to speak, but it wasn't large enough to cause the detection limit to kick in. So after a certain point, then it kicked in, and the average results of all the replicates was without these few replicates that have these non-stationary individuals in them. So then it looked good again. But what you can do if you think that you have problems like this and you don't want to increase the number of time points is you can save the results from each replication of the simulation study. And you can look at it. I looked at them in R, and it turned out to be the case that because I had a very large uh, mean squared error for one parameter. And it turned out to be that one of the replications had an estimate of 400, whereas all the other had around 0 
So the mean of that will, of course, be very off. But if I took it away, then it was fine. So this is something that you should be at least aware of, that this can, can, cause, can cause problems when you generate data with random coefficients from normal distributions. And then another thing that can be good to at least think about for a little while is that the, resi the residual variance of the random autoregressive coefficient. So if you have a mediation model on the between level and you include in, in the example that I used, age also, so you have this full mediation model, it's a saturated model. So essentially, the I, maybe I can go back to that picture of that point that it's here. Here. So essentially, I'm talking about the random autoregressive coefficient. This holds for all the, the random coefficients, but I think it's especially a large problem here. Bear with me. So if you include age here, and autoregressive coefficient. Essentially, if age explains all the variation in the autoregressive coefficient, then these two explain the same variation in the weight difference, right? So if, if age can explain all variation in the autoregressive coefficient, then including both of them would have perfect multicollinearity, essentially, which would make one of these slopes very poorly identified, or not identified at all if you would have perfect. Okay, so, and this is something that we know. This holds for all mediation models, of course, not only in the DSEM framework. So why is this a problem now? Uh, let's see if I can get back. Well, in this case, we don't have that much variation usually in the autoregressive coefficient to begin with. It's, we don't, in a lot of empirical data sets, we have pretty small variation in the random autoregressive coefficient. I mean, it's already bounded between minus one and one if we have a stationary process, but usually we have a pretty small distribution. So it might be the case that we might have some predictor that can explain some of the variation, maybe a lot, which would make the residual variance, which is the part of the variation that, in this case, H couldn't explain, very small in numerical values. And you can see in the plot here what happens to the mean squared error when you regress Z, which would correspond to the weight difference in my example on the random model regressive coefficient, if the residual variance becomes too small. So here it is 0.02, but when it comes to 0.01, the mean square error kind of explodes because there's so little variation left there to, to kind of identify this slope. So I think this might be a, a pro I didn't I didn't realize what the problem was. It took me a while. It took me some weeks, actually, to figure this out when I was setting up the simulations. So this is just something that you should think about. We have very small variations in some of these random coefficients. And if we, if we have that, then we might have problems with this. All right, so that's enough about the simulation study. Let's talk about the M plus automation package, so the R package. And even if you have had, maybe I can ask you, how many have, have or have used R or still use R? Oh, good. Well, maybe I should ask, how many use M plus automation? Oh, I still have a work to do here. That's good. Okay, so what is it? It's an R package. And you can use it for a lot of things. I'm, I'm not claiming that I'm going to cover the whole package here because it can do a lot. I'm just going to cover the pieces that I really like, that I use a lot. So what you can do, some of the things that you can do is that you can create many similar syntax files, so many similar input files automatically. So for example, if you have a simulation study where you just want to change the number of individuals or the sample size between the different runs, and you don't want to create all of these files by your hand, you can make R create them for you. Or if you want to exclude different parts of a sample. So we're going to look at an example of that when we do a time series model for each individual one at a time and compare that to the two level model for all the models, at, uh, for all individuals at, at the same time. So you can do that. And you can also uh, run batches of input files. So if you have a lot of input files that you've created by hand because you didn't know about this feature, which I didn't, so I created the 400 by hand, took a while. Um, you can run them, so you can just make queues. So you can tell R, I want to run all these input files. So put them in a queue, and whenever one is done, just start the next one, because I don't want to be up all night and guard these things. So I had two computers running day and night for two and a half months, basically. It became warm in my office. <laughs> and the final thing that you can do is they can extract, extract the output from the output files and get them into R. So when you have this, because I also ended up with then 400 output files. So what I could have done was go into each of them, copy what I liked, and then post it in some, I don't know, and then post it in R maybe. But instead you can extract them. So you can just extract the output from each of these output files that you have and put them in a list in R, or actually in a list of lists. And even if it's not the most convenient format in R, at least I don't think so, it still saves a lot of time. 
So now I will show you how to use this. So this will be a minimum working example. And I will ask Bang to upload the files that I use here so you can try it out if you haven't tried it out. And I think kind of I mean, anyone can make this run. And if you can make this example run, it's very easy to extend it to whatever you're doing, really. And I also want to mention that the guy, Michael Halquist, who has written this package, is a very service-minded guy. So if you ask him, email him a question, at least when I've done that, he's answered usually within a day. And I asked him about a function that, that I didn't know how to use, and he said, we don't have it. But here you have a new version that has it. So I, 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 he's a very nice guy. All right, so for the simulation study, uh, what I did was that I, yeah, I all, kind of already said this. I had nine models around 25 settings and then different effect sizes. So I ended up with 300. This, I actually checked this. It was more 400, 438. So I had two computers, three, three M plus applications running on each computer. And therefore, I had three R sessions on each computer having one Q at each of these R sessions. So one R session can have one Q. So if you want to run multiple applications parallelly, then you have to have more, I guess, I think so at least, you have to have more parallel R sessions as well. But this, that's not a problem. All right, so now I'm going to show you an example where we're going to run an autoregressive model of order one for each individual in a sample. So and this, this setup consists about from these three files. So you, and I will make sure that you can download these files from the, from the Mplus webpage at some point. So if you have, you have, we'll have an R script in which you write the R syntax, and you will have a text file which will contain the Mplus syntax and some other things. And finally, you need a data file if you're, I mean, we need a data set. So, so these are the three things that you need. And I'm going to throw each, go through each of them. So what you could have done now, which I, which I probably would have two years ago, you could create then 200, I, this 202 individuals in this samples. So I could have created 202 input files. And this just changed the use observations equal one, use observations equal two, and then created then 202 files. But that, that's not smart. So this is what you do. So this is the R Studio syntax. You could run this in any R program, really. I just used the R Studio because it has a lot of, it colors the text, which is good. Uh, and it also helps you out with a lot of things. But essentially, we have four lines of code here. The gray after the hashtag or the number is just comments that I made to make it easier for you. But it's essentially four lines of code here. It's the library M plus automation, which essentially tells R, I'm going to use this package. So I want, I want to have this, I want to load this package, I'm going to use it. And then create models, and then the M plus TXT. So here's the TXT file. Right, so the first file is this R Studio, or this R file, really. Uh, and the second file is the M plus TXT file. So I create models. That will create then 202 files. We don't know how at this point, but you have to trust me. And then I then have my 202 input files. Then I run, run this. So run models. That will run the 202 input files one by one after each other. And finally, I use the extract model parameters, which will extract the model parameters from each of the 202 output files that I will have gotten at that point, and put them in. I save them as uh, an object, which, which will be a list in this case that I call outputs. And actually, the extract model parameters, there's several functions for an, from, uh, that you can use to extract the information from the output. I usually end up using this one, but you can do it in several ways. This is just one minimum working example to get you started. All right, so what about this M plus TXT file here? What kind of magic is in that file that creates these 202 input files? Saved a lot of time if it worked. So how does it look? So this is how it looks. So first of all, antekninga is just a Swedish word for notepad. <laughs> so don't, don't think about that. So we have two parts here. We have this part that tells R what to do with this TXT file. And we have this part that looks very much like an M plus syntax file. And this essentially is an M plus syntax, exactly an M plus syntax file, except this little part here, which says square bracket, square bracket, individual, square bracket, square bracket. So individual within square brackets, double square brackets. That's the only part. So let's look at it. What we have here is we have a title, AR1, AR for one individual at a time. We have the data. So now the third file, the data file that I talked about, comes into play because we need a data set, obviously. In this case, we have 202 individuals measured, I think, 50 times. So this is a data file, and then we have the variable command where I say that I have in this file, we have an ID variable and a Y variable, and I want to use the Y variable. 
and I have a lagged y variable and I want to use the observation id equals to. And then I have this thing. So this is the thing that I want to vary, right? I want, I want it to be equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 202. That's what I want. One input file per value, per individual. And then finally ask for analysis, estimate equals space, and then the model. All right, so as you can see, this is kind of the magic here. So what, how do we define that? So now we move up to this part, which is the part that will tell R what to do. So we first say iterators equals, this is essentially, we just give the name to whatever we wanna, want to change. So this is the name of the iterator, something that we will iterate different values for. And then we define that iterator so first we give it a name, individual, and then we define it as individual should be a sequence from 1 to 202. So that will be just a vector of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up to 202. So that essentially makes then, this part just creates this thing that we want. It will take one value at a time. So now we will have this syntax file 202 times with the value 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, according to this definition. We, we don't have to have a sequence. We could have 1, 8, 9, and 202 if we wanted to. But we could also just create the whole sequence. That's the purpose of this analysis. And then we have some more things that we need to do. The file name is important here. We're going to create 202 files. So we can't just give them the name data file because then we will override it 200 times. So we have to give it a name as a function of the iterator in order to create, in this case, the first file will be individual-1-ar1.input. The second input file will have the number two here, and number three, and so on. So we can use the iterator also when we create the file name here, which is very, I mean, that, we need that, of course. And then finally, we, we want to store these files. So you can, you can specify a path here, and you actually have to specify a path here. So it's not like uh, if you have them in the same folder, it works out automatically. You have to specify a folder. So you see here that I have my Dropbox folder and Banks folder. And then we're testing and some stuff here. So this is just a path. You can save it anywhere on the computer, of course. So that's it. So if you run, if you have this txt file in the same folder as the R file and the data file, that's why I keep saying here, set the folder containing m plus to working directories, to say here. Set the folder containing input files as working. So if we, if we put all the files in the same folder to begin with, we still have to specify this path, but anything, all the other things will, will be done automatically. So if we run this syntax now, and we have this txt file and the data file in the same folder, it will create the 202 input files, run the 202 input files, extract information from the 202 output files. So it will take a while, but I think it took four minutes or six minutes or something like that, as opposed to probably two days if I would have done it by hand. So that's it. So what are you going to do with this then? Well, you can do whatever you like, you have this, now you have an object in R that contains all the information from the output, so now it's up to you what you want to do. I usually end up doing something stupid like for loop, extracting the parameter I want, and I just wanted to give you this because it took me a while to figure out how to use the, the old kind of notation here. I tend to use the tidyverse package now, which I talked about yesterday briefly. Uh, so, but this is just one way that you can do to extract. In this case, I extracted the AR1 parameter, so the ultra-aggressive coefficient from all the parts of the list, so for each individual. And then I made a summary out of it, so I saw that the median of all these individuals had was 0 0.25 and the mean was 0 0.23. And of course you can plot it and do whatever you want. So this is kind of the recipe for using this. I just wanted to make a list. I really like lists. I, I, I tend to think like algorithmically, I think. So this is what you need to do. So whenever these files are available, if you follow this, and I'm pretty sure it will run. Uh, so, so I encourage you to use this. I think it's a very nice way to really utilize M plus even, even better. All right, so that was about that. Now we're going to talk about non-normally distributed random coefficients. So this is a Monte Carlo study that me and Ellen Hamaker is, is working on. Uh, but now we've got some results that I want to share with you. So essentially, this distributional assumption of the random coefficients. So we have already talked about it, but I'm just going to recap here. So it's a model assumption regarding the distribution of the random coefficients. So we have this latent random coefficients, and we have this model assumption that they are following a normal distribution. So the natural question, which a lot of people ask, is what if they're not normal? 
what if the coefficients, the distribution of coefficients in the population is not normal? What if it's bimodal, or what if it's very skewed? What happens then? Will the model force it to be normal, or will, so to speak, the data overrule the assumption? Um, yes. So what we did here was that we generated data with this distribution of the random coefficient. So this is the, the true mean. Oh, sorry, it should be the other way around, I guess, when you look at, yeah. This is the, this is the phi parameter, and this is the mean parameter. So you should switch the titles here, of course. So the idea behind this is that say that we, we missed to have, maybe there's, this is two different groups. Maybe it's females and males. Of course, we could control for this on the between level, but say that we didn't know that they were so different and we didn't measure it for some reason. So we have missed some important between level predictors. So we don't know how to separate between these groups. So essentially, the population that we are sampling from has this random coefficient of the, of the autoregressive coefficient. It's kind of a mixture of two normals or bimodal uh, distribution. And the phi distribution as well, not as clearly, but still, it's not a normal. Oh, sorry, the mean. OK, so this is the phi parameter, and this is the mean. So the random autoregressive coefficient and the mean. So we have this three-dimensional picture of how it looks. So in this case, I did them. They're not correlated with each other. So, so uh, there's no correlation between these two. So the question is, what if the, if the true parameter has this distribution. What will happen to the estimates? So what we did then was to generate multi-level time series data according to, the, to this distribution. So that means that we know the true value of, of the uh, coefficients for each individual. So we save the true value for each individual from these coefficients. And then we run the, the data that we have uh, generated according to this in, with a decent model in M+. Plus. So a multi-level model running all of these individuals together and we save the factor score, actually the sum of the factors, the summary of the factor scores for each individual in M plus, which means that we have the, the point estimate for each individual now, and we have the true value for each individual. So we can compare the true value to the estimated value from the factor scores. And then we replicate this five, I actually increased this a thousand times. And we change the number of individuals and number of time points to see how it changes if you have a lot of time points. And actually, uh, the results we're going to look at now is for sample sizes with only 10 individuals. And that's because the number of individuals doesn't seem to matter here, which is kind of what we would expect. Uh, and I had to rerun this for some reasons, and uh, the only one I had finished in time was the n equals 10 time. It's n, n equals 10, so 10 individuals. So these are the results. So we have, this is the mean, the random mean, and this is the random autoregressive coefficient. And we have the, what I call the bimodal case which is when we have generated data with the true underlying distribution of bimodal on the random coefficients. And as a benchmark, I also generated normal data, so under the, true, under the correct assumption to have something to compare to. So the first thing here is correlation. So this is just a correlation between the uh, estimated value for each individual with the true value for each individual. And then it's averaged over the 500 applications. So we can see that it's, for the mean, it's very, very close. And for the phi parameter, it's also very close. And as t increases, sorry, we have t on the x-axis here for all of these plots. So we have 10 time points and 100 time points. I see that it's pretty small. But you have them in the handouts, I guess. But as t increases here, we see that they're close to begin with. We're very close in the end. If you look at the correlation, if you look at the mean squared error, uh, which you can get for an M+, plus, uh, which Tiomir showed you earlier today, I did this in R just because I had generated the data in R for this results, uh, you can see that for the mean squared error, when the t is too small, both of these have pretty bad precision. You see the, the, this, the scale here is pretty small because everything is pretty good. But at the time of t equals 30, they are equally good for the mean. And the same thing holds for the phi here. And if you look at the bias, which is then the, the true value minus the, the predicted value, Yes, uh, you can see the same kind of pattern. But the point is here that for very small t, t smaller than 30, it matters. At that point, the, the, the distributional assumption kind of has an influence. So in that point, it's better if the data is normal in the population. But at t equals 30, you kind of overrule that. 
So at t equals 30 for this data set and also the skew data sets that I've been looking at, I've been looking at some different by model models, but also different kind of skew normals. And this seems to hold for all the cases that I've been looking at. So around t equals 30, this underlying assumption of the random coefficients uh, is overruled by data. So yeah, this was exactly kind of what I said. And like Tumor said, you can kind of think about this assumption, the normal assumption, as a prior. It's not a prior in the sense that you can put different alternatives. You cannot choose what it is in the syntax. But it kind of works as a prior in the sense that if you have data enough, then this will be overruled. So if you have more time points than 30, or even larger than that, then it doesn't really matter. Then the normal assumption will not longer play a part. The data will have overruled it, just like we see with other kinds of priors. Um, did I have anything more to add there? Yeah, I also wanted to say that we don't see that from this picture, but we could also see that the Nichols bias that, that the Tiermere and, and other was talking about, this is, uh, this is the mean of each individual, right? Uh, sorry, this is the correlation and the MSE for each individual, but if you look at the same for the, for the mean of the random coefficients rather than each individual by themselves, you also see that the bias is going away here. So the, we don't see that bias. As time increases, kind of everything works out, just like you see here. Um, yes. Good. That brings us up to the example of household electricity consumption data, electricity consumption data. So this was, uh, I was talking about this kind of the DSEM models for a psychology group in which there was one cognition uh, guy that had this friend who works with electricity data and uh, they have a lot of time points. So I got this data and uh, we did some interesting things, I think. So essentially the question that they have is, can basic information make residents in a house use their electronic devices optimally? And optimally is, I will define that. But can we change the behavior in people's uh, electricity consumption by giving them general information? Uh, at least in Sweden, we have this trend now that the electricity uh, companies, they, they want to give you this, uh, this uh, iPads that give you kind of direct feedback about how to improve your electricity consumption in different ways. And uh, the, the psychology lab that I work with here, the cognition lab in Uppsala, they kind of had this idea that if you get so much information, you don't, you don't really know what to do. You have too many parameters that you can change. So their idea was like, maybe if we just give them one thing to change. Maybe we can, maybe that can help them more in some sense. So as I said, this is a joint work with the Cognition Lab and also the Department of Industri Indu Industrial Engineering and Management at Uppsala University. So they have done a lot of work with collecting this data and just looking at it. So what we have is a very special house, a newly built house in Uppsala with 60 apartments. So they built it two years ago. And this house has solar panel on the roof. However, the people who live in this house don't know that. That's weird. <laughs> so they made a mistake, really. When they, when they sold the apartments in this house, they just uh, they, they said that it was like a greenhouse or something. But for some reason, they didn't get the information that they had solar panels on the roof. So it was kind of a mistake. Someone made a mistake. So as a I mean, accordingly, the people don't know that they have it. So they, they use their electricity from these panels uh, are not using the, yeah, they're not using it optimally, of course. So the optimal thing to do if you have a solar panel is to use the power while, while it's produced. Because you can't really buffer it, at least now, maybe in the future, but you cannot buffer it. And in Sweden, you can sell it to the grid, but you will get a really bad price. So if you want to really utilize this, you want to use it while you produce it, and then just buy the rest that you cannot produce yourself. So the energy consumption is measured every hour for each apartment here. And they've been doing that for seven months. So even though I only have 60 individuals, household in this case, I have around 4,000 time points. And in addition, which actually makes a difference in this case, I have daily energy consumption uh, a year before that. So I have daily data for one year, and then I have this seven months of hourly data on their electricity consumption. So this is how it looks. So we have two different apartments here. And this is just two weeks that I chose arbitrarily. It's the same weeks for the two apartments, but the 
two arbitrarily chosen weeks from these uh, seven months. So, uh, as you can see, there are some similarities and some dissimilarities between these. You have these peaks, and the peaks are when they use their um, dishwasher, their oven, and their washing machine, essentially. These are the things that tend to create these peaks. The other things is the TV and the, and the internet and uh, charging their phones and stuff like that. But it, I just added this solid line here, which I think is, uh, we have the uh, kilowatts, watts, hours of the day here, which is a measure of the consumption, really. And we have one measure per hour here. So you can see this solid line, which is, uh, I just put it in so you can compare them. The first department is over this line for almost all the measures, where this is under this line, except for the peaks, for almost all these measures. And if you look at the data and you try to, to imagine that there is no peaks, you see that this apartment has larger variation in this lower part than this very, uh, apartment. So kind of early on, it makes sense to think in, in kind of a two-level model here, where you, have, you need to have household-specific parameters for this. And you need, of course, to take this into account. So most of this tend to be uh, weekdays effects. A lot of these peaks, people tend to do the same things every day. It, I don't know if that's a Swedish thing, but you do your, you do, you do your laundry on Sundays, for example. Or you, I don't know, you make your, all your, uh, if you're going to bring food to work, you make, maybe you do all of it on the Sunday night or something like that. So, so you might use the stove more that, that, those hours. So when I control for weekdays on the within level, I can take a lot of this away, actually. But this is the kind of data that we need to, to that I need to work with. So uh, like you see, we have strong, you couldn't see that really because this was just two weeks. But if you look at the whole data, you see that we have strong weekday effects. So I think all the days of the week was significant if you control them for them on the within level. Uh, and you have cycles over 24 hours. People tend to use their power more in the morning before they go to work. And then they, use, they don't use it during the day as much. And then they use it at night. And you have cycles over weeks, like I said, weekdays effects, and you have over months and years. And in Sweden, you can really see, uh, see the consumption as a function of the sunrise and the sunset because it's very dark and cold, usually, all the time. <laughs> so so uh, you can really see, see the, when the fall comes, the consumption goes up. You have to put on lights because it's very dark. So, and also, like I said, there's lots of variation across the apartments. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider here. So the research question, as I said, was can general information make people change their electricity consumption behavior? So what we would like is for them to move their electricity consumption from the morning and the nighttime to the middle of the day. And the interesting thing with this house is that they all have the same dishwasher, the same uh, washing machine, uh, because it's newly built house. So they, it's kind of a standard. So we know that all of them have timer functions on these machines. So all of them potentially could move their consumption of these machines to the daytimes by using the timer functions. So that's exactly the intervention. The intervention is just information about how to program the dishwasher machine and the washing machine. And we made it in the form of a sticker that they can actually put. We measured it so that it fits on the, on the machine. So they can put it on the machine. So each time they're going to use it, it says, please postpone it to these hours by pu pushing that button, something like that. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of... Uh, intervention that we're looking at here. And we're going to roll it out, actually, because I'll talk, maybe I'll get back, yeah, I'll get back to that. Uh, so that, that's the intervention. So that's what we're going to see if we can make a change with that simple information. So it's not a personalized feedback or anything. We're just going to give them general information about how much money the house can save. And I got this great advice from uh, J.P. Lawrence So the other day to also make them to say something about that others had made a lot of money. So you kind of get this. <laughs> You know, like, there's, it's fun because there's a similar house that actually, they, they know that they have solar panels, which is, which is reasonable, and uh, <laughs> they have a totally different consumption behavior. But we don't know if that depends on that, they had selection of who moved into this house. So maybe a lot of like very, very aware of, uh, I don't know, their consumption behaviors moved into that house. But we don't need to tell this house that. We can just say that, look how much money they save. So we, we try to... Yeah, push them. I think JP called it nudging. All right. So this is kind of the model I had in mind. This is a simplified version. I just wanted to use kind of the same picture here to see that you can use kind of the same picture for a lot of the same kind of model for different things. So now we have the consumption at our T as a function of the consumption of the previous hour. And we allow them for the random coefficient here. 
and we essentially see if there's a difference in any of these parameters due to the intervention. And the interesting thing here is that we don't really expect a difference in the mean. That's not what we want. I mean, people still need to wash their clothes and do the dishes with the washing machine, dishwasher machine. So what we want to see is a change maybe in the autoregressive coefficient, maybe make them more predictable and at least less random. We would like them to be more predictable in one sense. So it's, in this case, it makes a lot of sense to not only look at the mean. Actually, it might be other things that is more important here. So that's one of the neat things, I think, about this. All right. But then there are some other things to think about here. Like you saw, n is pretty small, around 60. It's actually 56. So efficiency is crucial. Just I like, like I just said in the simulation study, the large number of individuals seem to be very important for these models, more than, more than number of time points. I have a lot of time points, so I probably can benefit from that. You can see we, we saw this different allocation. So I have so many time points, so it might still work. And 50 seems to be enough, at least for this kind of model. If I don't have any outcome model here, as you know now, you don't have to have the same huge number of individuals. But still, I want to make sure that we have efficiency. I, I, I want to make sure that we have as much power as we can possibly have. So what I will do, or have done actually, is because they haven't rolled out this information yet. So the intervention is going to roll out actually in a couple of weeks. So we have designed this study by clustering on the values of random coefficients. So what we try to do now to begin with is to find household that has very similar energy consumption behavior now, before the treatment. So we find it, it, households that are very similar, and then we random, so clusters of, of similar households, and then we randomize the treatment to within these clusters. So we know that we have, they are similar to begin with, so we could probably gain some efficiency there. And essentially we do matching based on the values of the random coefficients. So I've been fitting a model with all these three coefficients random, saving the factor score for each household, and then I've been running different kinds of clustering techniques on that data. Uh, and seeing if, if it makes sense. I, can, I mean, I can, I can make clusters and then I can look at the time series of the clusters and see, do they look similar? In what sense are they similar? And I'm actually going to show you that uh, in a while, how similar they are and what kinds of clusters I find. And in this case, we also needed to use a step wedge design because, uh, when, because actually this one guy living in this house who works at the uh, Department of uh, Industrial Engineering so he kind of figured it, this out because uh, he's very aware of these things. And then he told the board of the house this, that they didn't know. So they was like, oh, we have to tell everyone. And he was like, no, 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 we're going to do an intervention study here. Uh, <laughs> but so the compromise was that in the end, everyone has to know. That was like the, the criteria on the, from the board there. We, we, we will let you play with this if in the end, after six months, everyone knows. So we will, have to, we will roll out the intervention. So, in a step wedge design. So we will, in the first, now in, the, in September, some individuals randomized within these clusters will have information. So some individual from each cluster will get this information. The next month, some other will. So we will roll it out. Uh, and also, to gain precision here, we will use the daily data to obtain informative priors of the weekday effect and other things that are varying on the, on the daily level. So I will, I will definitely utilize this year of data, so 365 data points or even more, I think, to get informative priors for the parameters in the models that I'm not really interested in in, that in, in the main sense. I just want to make sure that we control for all these kind of trends and cycles. So I can really add these informative priors here and, and, and increase the precision a lot, actually. And then finally, I will test for intervention effect with the DSM models. And I'm also looking forward to, to working with the cross-classified models here and see if I can plot the shift. If there is a, an effect of this intervention, maybe I can see it in the, how the random coefficients change over time. So what I would like to see is at the time of the intervention, people change a lot. And then maybe it goes down, but hopefully it stabilizes at another level than it was to begin with. So this is how the clusters look. So what we have here is the, this is the mean, this is the autoregressive coefficient, and this is the residual variance. And the scales here are off. Something happened in the R plot command here. So it's, there's some factor here. But, so this should be 0 0.05, I think, something like that. This should be 0 0.15 at least. Uh, so what you can see here is, and this, I chose four clusters here. 
and this is not what I ended up using actually. Uh, I get data in real time, so I can log on and then I have new hours, so I can refit this and see if there's any, anyone has switched clusters really. So when I get back, I'll have like a week of new data, so that will be exciting, I guess. So what we can see here is that if we cluster on, we have four clusters here. If we look at the mean, the mean of the consumption, we see that cluster one and four and two and three are separated from each other. So these are not separated from each other, but these, these, and these are separated from each other. So we, we have differences here, like significant differences probably if you look at the confidence bands here. And, f and actually two and three, they are separated by the autoregressive coefficient. So we kind of have four unique clusters here in some sense. Even though they are similar on the mean here, they're not similar on the autoregressive coefficient. So I just I, I uh, added here, or included the re autoregressive, uh, sorry, the residual variance here. They didn't differ there. So, and actually if I remove this variable from the clustering, I still have these four clusters. So this was not not an important variable, it turns out. So I'll probably still let it be in the model, because as you've seen, it might be important to, to allow for individual differences in the, in the variance to not mess up other things, but I will not use it as a part of the clustering probably. So uh, this is not the clusters that I used, but they were pretty similar. So what I did now is that I randomized the rollout order within these clusters. So these clusters are not exactly the same size, but I limit them to be of kind of similar size. So there's a lot of thinking going on in, in making that work because I'm going to roll it out so they have to be of a size so I can actually roll it out and still have comparisons and stuff like that. But this is the design that we, that we oh, this is the method that we use to design this, this study really. So I think it's neat because we kind of utilize a lot of things here. We use the DSEM model to design the study. We use the Bayesian model to include the previous knowledge that we have. Uh, and we will use also the, the Bayesian, uh, the DSEM models both to, to see if we have a significant effect using the method that Ellen showed where you will have different periods. You shift them into different variables. And we can also use the cross-classified models to see this visually potentially. So uh, that was what I had to say at this point. And now you learned a little bit about life in Sweden. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. dark. <laughs> it actually but is. But you get an iPad, <laughs> and you don't have to compete about which dishwasher you use. Everybody has the same in the building. Yeah. Yeah. All right, questions? on any of these parts. Yes. Thank you. You mentioned it briefly, but could you talk a little bit about the effect sizes for the simulation study? You talked about weak and then, you know, yeah. how if you make it a little larger. So where were you with what you were testing? I used the Cohen effect size definitions. So weak is uh, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 standard deviation change in the outcome variable for one standard deviation change in the predictor. So that was what I used. And when I, when I increased it to moderately strong, I was around 0 0.4 when I saw this, drastically th this drastic increase. So I'm not talking about huge effects to lower this. It seems to be like a, a bound here. You know, I'm talking about the signal to noise ratio. I think it makes sense to talk about that in this case because it's a very complex model. And when the signal is too weak, it just blurs out. But at the point where you actually have a signal that you can find, then you don't have to have the large sample sizes. Wait, wait, wait. Is there any way to constrain autoregression parameter to less than one? Well, that's a good question that I think Tiamir will talk about. <laughs> Isn't that how you do it, Bengt? That's how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, well, um, no, uh, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> also a classic the, answer. For, um, the, uh, so, Generally speaking, the uh, as you generate, you know, as the MCMC sequence um, generates the um, the autoregressive parameter, it's quite common that it goes over one. Actually, uh, you know, it's just part of the. There's no technical constraint that actually would force it to be less than one. And uh, you know, a lot of these examples, you know, uh, it often comes up close to one, and so it has a posterior distribution, and it it's kind of easy to go over one. Technically, it's not a problem, so. Um, no, it's just more yeah. a problem when you generate data. I mean, in, in, in real data sets, people's urge process don't tend to explode, right? I mean, if we measure it on an 11-point scale, especially. But, so, so I mean, in, in real life, we have, I mean, things are stationary 
like by their nature in more sense. But when we generate data, we will just like have a probability model. So if, if we have an, an, a non-stationary process, it will explode by time. I mean, that wouldn't happen. In, in, so so we have, you have to think about it when you do simulation more than when you do empirical analysis. And like, like Theomir says, when you do this many replications and many individuals and over and over again, even if there's a very, very small probability of actually generating or drawing an autoregressive coefficient larger than one, it will happen, kind of. So you have to think about so, it. So there's a, a, a distinction between, um, you know, in the ge data generation, right, there's one autoregressive parameter that doesn't change. And if it happens to be over one, it will, you know, you're going to use that parameter in, you know, the data will explode, where in the posterior distribution, you know, it could happen that in some iterations it goes over one, but there has no consequence of any kind. It will eventually go back down. So When we talk about the data exploding, that's not literally. <laughs> but it means that the Y values become huge yeah. as the time goes on. That's what we mean. Thanks. Do you mind talking through a little bit about the formation of the clusters that you had? So I know that you use DSIM to sort of look at the, you know, within and between person differences, but then you establish some very unique groups of um, apartments based on that information. So I don't know if you use specific cut scores, just sort of talk. I used, I used the package in, uh, I just, I tried out a large different of functions because I was like, I was thinking about like, how can I use because I was thinking about all the time, like how can I quant quantify the difference between processes over time? That's kind of how I think about these two level models. And I'll think like, this is good because I want to find similar, similar apartments in this case. So I just saved all the factors because I have this three values for each apartment that I have in a data set. So three columns and just the number of rows are the number of apartments. And then I used a lot of different, I tried out a lot of different techniques in, uh, in R to uh, actually, in this case, a lot of different clustering techniques. So there are packages that w in which you can just change the algorithm and you can constrain how many parameters. So in this, I think this is hierarchical, if that's, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, clustering. I also tried like k-means and a lot of different, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a, that's not my area of expertise. I just tried out different ones and then I looked at it because I mean, there's no problem at looking at the data. We don't have the outcome yet, so we're not, we're not gonna, mess up the, the causality in this treatment by looking at the data before we do the treatment, right? Before we do the randomization. So I, I did the clusters and then I looked at the time series. Are these actually similar in a way that I think that they are qualitatively similar? So that was you can use in N plus, you can use mixture of bivariate normals. So yes. that, would be, yeah. that, that would have been an alternative for sure. So now uh, when we gave a, a version, an early version of this workshop, a very rudimentary version of this workshop uh, in the Netherlands three weeks ago. It's, it's developed quite a lot. But there a Swedish gentleman from the Royal Technical School in Stockholm came up and uh, said, I have energy data, can you help me? How does yeah. that, how, how, how do he, his data um, differ yeah. from these? Well, first of all, he had hourly data for five years for about 10,000 apartments. <laughs> so I was like, no, <laughs> but then of course, yes. Uh, so he had another kind of very interesting uh, intervention type of situation which, and I will, I will, I'm just waiting to get this data so I can run cross-classified stuff on it because what they had was that they changed the way you pay for the electricity in, these, in some of the houses. So you know when they did that from the apartment level, so you pay for your own consumption to the house level. So you pay the average of what everyone used. Which means that if I use a lot, then my neighbors have to pay for, you know, like the difference. So there's no point for me to try to save data if, I, if I'm not a very, like, I don't know, a good person, I guess. But so, so it's a very interesting thing to see how the consumption change. Uh, and we actually have some other houses w which have done the opposite because they can do this. I mean, it's up to the house, really, or the, the owner of the house or the, the group that runs, you know, I don't... Stu, you say. The uh, apartment board. Yeah, the apartment board. <laughs> uh, so, so they can do how they want, but we have information about it because it, it, it changes how you, how you pay for things, changes the taxes, and we keep track of everything. So we have, we have a lot of data on this. So, we can, so what I'm hoping to see then, I want to use the cross-classified stuff because now I have hourly data. So for each hour, I have 10,000 observations for five years. So if there is, I can really establish like how they behave 
before this treatment happened. I had two, two years kind of before the treatment. I can really establish how they behave and see if there is a change in behavior that we cannot explain by the usual fluctuation at the point where they change this payment. And I'm hoping to see this in the cross-classified plots over time, you know, where we have this stable mean which I've seen for these, these households, they have a very stable, I, I run cross-classified on this and just looked at the mean over time and it's very stable over time. So I, and I, that kind of fits with me at least, I have a lot of habits, I don't really, that sounds boring, but I don't really change a lot, you know. So, <laughs> so, so that's a very interesting data set which I can't really wait to get home and look at. But also have to figure out how to handle that kind of amount of data, I guess Tiumir will have to figure that out. Now, um what about, um, where do you find M plus automation? Well, internet is the short <laughs> answer. No, but it, I don't know, a lot of, I, it looked like most of you have used R, right? So if you, if you used R, I mean, if you just Google M plus automation, you can find it on the web page. On, on M plus web page, you can find information about how to use it. But uh, I would just Google the documentation. So if you Google M plus automation, you will have everything you need. There's a lot of other people that done minimum working examples and stuff like that. I just didn't think I found one that was minimal, minimal enough. So I tried to make it as minimal as I possibly could in this example, because usually they tend to do an example that contains so much that if you don't get it, it's hard to kind of figure out. I'm, I'm talking for myself now. Yeah. Other questions? All right, maybe this is a good drop in and out. Good uh, transition to a little audience participation. This is supposed to be a lead in to uh, indicate the diversity of applications. Many of you have few time points, perhaps few people, many time points. Here we have many time points, many people. Depends on the application. So uh, do we have Lola in the audience now? Would you mind coming up on the stage? And share with us. And Lola's card says that she's uh, in working at Duke Cancer Institute Best Surgical Oncology. And uh, we have a surgeon here. I don't think there are many of you out there, perhaps, who are surgeons. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank um, Bengt and Morton and Ellen and Timur for running such an amazing course, such that even a statistical dilettante like myself can follow along, or at least hang on um, by my seat. Um, I wanted to just see um, kind of where people were coming from because in part to see whether there are collaborations that could come out of these type of meetings where people are from such different backgrounds. So um, hopefully afterwards I can implore our uh, course organizer to send out an email list with everyone's kind of specialties and where they're from such that there can be uh, more collaboration afterwards. But as a show of hands, um, who would say that they're from a social science background? That would be sociology. Uh, economics, psychology, poli sci, or education. Whoa. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Natural science or healthcare. Okay. Um, and then physical science, math, statistics, computer science, engineering. All right. Any humanists out there? <laughs> Didn't think that was super likely. Okay. So that was interesting. I wasn't quite expecting it to be. Uh, so heavily uh, biased towards social sciences. But anyway, uh, hoping that we can maybe connect later on. I'm happy to lend my medical skills to anyone who needs it to make a interestingly uh, methodological paper more clinically applied. So anyway, thank and, you. And let me say also, who, who of you have physiological data that you're gonna work with? That's maybe overlapping here. And uh, okay, Do you, who has uh, blood sugar data? Who has sleep deprivation data? And who has brain wave data? Three brains. <laughs> who, who are we uh, leaving out in the physiological measures area? Oh, biomechanistic. I will have some data that forces on joints in the body while doing a task. I'll have some postural data, head position while driving a car, um, potentially, what's the other one I have? EMG, so muscle activity while doing a task. We've also got other data that's gait, uh, gait parameters while walking. And? Mark? Um, 
We're, we're modeling oncology data, um, oh. breast cancer, um, lung cancer, uh, for phase three trials at Lilly. Where are you working? Eli oh, Lilly and company. Okay, I'll try and find you. So there. I have RTI collaborators here with me, and uh, we, we think we found an answer why we failed in the PRO analysis for 20 years, and it was because of non-random missingness. And when we correct for that, uh, the results are pretty amazing using M+. Plus. <laughs> Got ask the of the data. Oh, and, and then this, this is brand new, and it's something I've, I've begun to advocate at the company. Um, we're going to implement iPhone data collection for randomized clinical trials, and um, j just as a design um, thought, ideation, it's probably how it's going to go. We have two groups of, of treatments, uh, drug A, drug B, you know, one, one's a lily drug, then the comparator. And we'll randomize each maybe three to one to get the iPhone, and the other will just go on normal symptom monitoring. So the people with the iPhone will give us daily reports of their adverse events, consequences of treatment, quality of life. And, and when it hits a certain level, um, we'll have um, nurse consultants or, 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 or someone like that get in touch with the patient to help them monitor their symptoms. Were you at ASCO this year? I was. Ethan Bosch. This is Ethan Bash. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, Friends. all right. <laughs> so, so we're going to do the Ethan Bash, and what Ethan showed, he's at uh, UNC, I believe, right, right I'm now. I'm at Duke, but I won't hold that against him. <laughs> yeah. But, but amazingly, he showed that an intervention like this added f five months of survival to breast cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some other types of cancer there, but it was breast cancer, which is amazing because the, these are metastatic patients that um, five months is huge. And everybody said, well, this was the, uh, the physician intervention, the nurse and that. But it's also the Hawthorne effect, mm -hmm. you know, Something's which people know about. It becomes more likely to be seen. So, yeah. so it's a combination of features. And, and so we're developing this app, and we'll have a huge oh. amount of data because, um, you know, it, it could be six times a day because we're measuring pain meds and the response to those. So quality of life in that um, for over six months, a year, two years, who knows? But we need to analyze it properly to design the trial. So we're gonna begin with the end in mind. And um, this is right, right exactly what we need, intensive longitudinal analyses. Well, I'll try and connect with you afterwards. Hopefully other people will find similar types of kindred spirits. So thanks, anyway, Ben. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you, that was very brave. <laughs>